Neptune was first discovered using math. In the year 1845, two astronomers independently calculated the orbit of the planet. They did this by observing perturbations in the orbit of the planet Uranus. The names of these two, which I might butcher, are Urbain Lee Verrier and John Couch Adams. Pretty sure I got that second one right. Now, with this information, a third astronomer became the first to visually identify Neptune. He did this on the night of September 23rd or 24th of 1846. And his name was Johann Gottfried Galle. This is Cup of Science Joe, and today we will be covering the eighth planet in our solar system, Neptune. Johann spotted Neptune using the Fraunhofer telescope seen here which was at the Berlin Observatory at the time. He needed a telescope for this as the planet is not bright enough to be seen with the naked eye. It was only a single degree away from its calculated position, which is very impressive to me. After its formal discovery, we would come to learn that several astronomers in the past, starting with Galileo Galilei in 1612, had also observed Neptune. But because of how slowly it moved relative to the background stars, they did not recognize it as a planet. Similar to Uranus, it would be a while before we would learn more about Neptune, just because of how far away it is. But we were able to make some initial discoveries. Let's touch on these before we continue. Shortly after Neptune's discovery, its first moon was spotted on October 10th, 1846, this time by astronomer William Lassell. This moon would go on to remain unnamed, though, for over a hundred years, until 1949, when Neptune's second moon was discovered and given the name Nereid. It was at this point that its first moon also received a name, Triton. Then, in 1981, a third moon was discovered during an unsuccessful search for rings around the planet. However, like its ice giant counterpart, we would come to learn much more about this majestic blue planet. This would happen in the year 1989, between June and October, by none other than the Voyager 2 spacecraft. It took the spacecraft 12 years to reach Neptune, moving at a speed of 19 kilometers a second. This journey took it 4.5 billion kilometers, or 30 astronomical units, which is about 30 times as far away from the sun as we here are on Earth. Upon making this journey though, what exactly did Voyager 2 find? Let's start with the two things we had mentioned earlier. The planet's moons and its rings, which it did end up having. Neptune has 16 known moons, with the largest one also being the for first discovered, Triton. And this moon in particular has some interesting features to it. The most notable being that it is the only large moon in our solar system that circles its planet in a direction opposite to the planet's rotation. This is known as a retrograde orbit. This suggests that Triton may once have been an independent object that was captured by Neptune. This moon also happens to be extremely cold with surface temperatures around minus 235 degrees Celsius. Despite this deep freeze, however, Voyager 2 discovered geysers spewing icy material upward more than eight kilometers. Triton also has a thin atmosphere, and we have detected it from Earth several times since Voyager 2 was there. This atmosphere is growing warmer. Currently, scientists do not know why this is happening. 
This does kind of make me wonder, though. Is the source of the geysers and the source of the atmosphere warming somehow connected to each other? For the rings now, it has at least five main rings that we know of anyway. Starting near the planet and moving outward, these rings are named Gale, Levier, I probably said that wrong, Lassel, Arago, and Adams. These rings are thought to be both relatively young and short-lived. The ring system also has some peculiar clumps of dust called ring arcs. The outermost ring atoms has four of them, which are quite prominent. These arcs are strange because the laws of motion would predict that they would spread out more evenly rather than staying clumped together. Scientists now think the gravitational effects of Galatea, a moon just inward from the ring, is what is stabilizing these arcs, basically acting as a shepherd moon. Being one of the gas giants, Neptune is quite big too, albeit it's the smallest of the four, though I believe it's the most dense. I think it's the densest of the gas giants. It has a diameter of about 49,521 kilometers, making it roughly four times wider than Earth. If I were to use a similar comparison as my last video, if Earth was the size of a nickel, Neptune would be the size of a baseball. Earlier I had mentioned that it took Voyager 2 12 years to reach Neptune, but light coming from the sun can do it in a mere four hours. How amazing would it be if we could achieve even close to light speed travel? It would open up a lot of what we could do. Like the other giant planets in our solar system, Neptune is spinning rather quickly. It takes the planet about 16 hours to complete one rotation. Its orbit though, again because of how far out it is, takes much longer than ours. Neptune makes one orbit around the sun every 165 years, which means we won't even live to see one of those orbits. Something I find interesting though, is that there are times during this orbit in which Pluto is closer to the sun than Neptune is. For a 20 year period that is reoccurring every 248 years. This is due to Pluto's highly eccentric oval shaped orbit. The last time this happened was from 1979 to 1999, so within a lot of our lifetimes. Luckily for Pluto though, because this would be a losing battle, it can never crash into Neptune. This is because for every three orbits Neptune makes around the sun, Pluto makes two. This repeating pattern prevents them from ever approaching closely to each other. Neptune has a much milder axis of rotation when compared to its counterpart Uranus. Its tilt is 28 degrees with respect to the plane of its orbit. This means that it is quite similar in that regard to us here on Earth and to Mars as well. What this means is that Neptune does experience seasons in the same way we do, only for much longer. Because its orbit is so long, each of its four seasons lasts over 40 years. So just imagine that, right? Practically half of our lives there would be within one season. We'd be lucky to see two seasons total, or I guess really lucky to see three seasons total. Also, like its counterpart in the other gas giants, Neptune does not have a solid surface. Its atmosphere instead consists primarily of hydrogen, helium, and then a small amount of methane. And extending to great depths as well. It gradually merges into water and then other melted ices as it does so. All of this sits above a solid core with roughly the same mass as Earth. The atmosphere is quite similar to Uranus, and it turns out that its color might be too. 
To start off, the blue hue of these planets comes from the small amount of methane found in their atmospheres, which absorbs other colors while reflecting the blue light. Some of the images you will have seen in this video depict Neptune as being a darker blue, but it seems like this may have been a deliberate choice by the Voyager team to help better reveal features of the planet. Just this year, 2024, researchers reprocessed the images showing that Neptune may look a lot more similar to Uranus than many, including myself, had originally thought. Another feature of Neptune's atmosphere is that it has the strongest winds in our solar system. Despite its great distance and the low amount of energy it receives from the sun, Neptune's winds can be three times stronger than Jupiter's and nine times stronger than Earth's. These winds whip up clouds of frozen methane across the planet moving at speeds more than 2,000 kilometers per hour. For an example, even Earth's most powerful winds top out at 400 kilometers per hour. So yeah, that's a big jump there. And in 1989, a large oval-shaped storm appeared in Neptune's southern hemisphere, dubbed the Great Dark Spot. It was large enough to contain the entire Earth but it has since disappeared. New ones have appeared in its place though, on different parts of the planet. Neptune also has a magnetic field. It is tipped over a bit compared to the planet's rotation axis by about 47 degrees or so. And this causes it to undergo some pretty wild variations during each rotation because it is misaligned. Its magnetic field is about 27 times stronger than the one we have here on Earth, so it's a, it's a beefy boy. I have read that there may even be a future planned mission to return to Neptune, though many of us know these do not always go through. It is known as Neptune Odyssey, and it would be an orbiter meant to study both the planet and its moons, but with a focus on its largest moon, Triton. While I do know there is much for us to be studying out there, even in just our solar system, I would be excited to see a modern space mission revisit one of the ice giants. If this mission ends up going through, it would be set to launch in 2033 with an arrival time at Neptune of 2049, well within many of our lifetimes. You know, perhaps someone who sees this video may even be part of that very mission. Which, while a tall order, would be super cool to me and would make me very happy. My hope here is that you've learned something today and are maybe even a bit more excited about space exploration, our solar system, and who knows, maybe even our universe at large. If you would like to learn more about our solar system's other ice giant, Uranus, check out this video right here. Otherwise, I implore you to step outside tonight and look towards the stars.